today, this morning, whatever time it happens to be where you are, we are very pleased to bring you Luke Mettings. Luke puts the L in learning unplugged. He's one of my educational heroes and mentors and friends and very happy to have you with us. Jason, thanks again for being here every day. It's a great pleasure. Really looking forward to this, this presentation. Welcome, Luke. <clears throat> Thank you for having me, guys. I'm going to take you over to the classroom. Everybody hang on because there's going to be a little time warp thing happening here. Hang on. Okay. There we go. So, Luke, we'll get out of your way. The slides what move just with that little arrow. They're coming up. We'll just wait until they do. The slides are so, yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. okay. You know Enjoy, everyone. Right? <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, thanks, both of you, and thanks, Barbara, also, and uh, ITDI for uh, asking me to be part of this summer intensive. And I've been joining as many of the talks as I can. And there's this great vibe, and uh, it's got a real nice summer feel. Um, my slides, I think, are going to have a funky feel because <laughs> they've changed uh, between my machine and uh, and the one there. But that's cool. Um, they're pretty minimal, anyway. Um, punctuation marks, it probably doesn't sound like the sexiest title for a talk, um, but I hope that we can have some fun with them and do some thinking really about what we do uh, at a real kind of underground level in the classroom, uh, how we manage conversation, how we encourage our learners to participate fully in conversation, and also to reflect on the role that we have in our learners' lives. So I'm hoping that we can get a lot out of these punctuation marks. And I'm, oh, I'm scrolling on two, two different <laughs> presentations. All right, now, um, I don't know if any of you have near you a pen or paper. You don't really need a pen or paper, but just um, a place to, to keep a thought so that it can just be in your mind. Um, and hold on to this thought for later. So don't type anything uh, into the chat box just yet, although you'll get a chance to do it later. And my question is, so no typing. Um, I guess you can talk because we can't hear you. What's your favorite? Punctuation mark. No typing. Just have a think about it. I don't know if you've ever been asked that question before. What's your favorite punctuation mark? So make a mental note or scribble it down somewhere. Because we're going to come back to that. Um, so, punctuation marks, we think of it as being what it is, part of written English. Um, we often talk about punctuation in the context of getting things right, of correctness. Um, sometimes when things are badly punctuated in public places, we, we smile at it or we think that people haven't quite got their grammar down. Um, but I want to think about punctuation in the context of conversation, which might feel a little strange. So an easy way into it, perhaps, is to think about one of the ways that we communicate in a, a conversational way throughout the day, which is you know, using our fingers and thumbs on uh, mobiles and devices of various sorts. Because we use punctuation marks very expressively when we chat. And punctuation can really change the meaning of what we have to say when we're texting. Just think of the phrase, miss you. Um, imagine you're having a conversation with someone and you write or they write, yes, miss you. Um, written as just miss you, um, without any punctuation afterwards, it's kind of neutral. And you could say that to pretty much 
anyone, I guess you'd need to know them quite well, but it could be your brother or sister. Um, and notice how just here, we can't see any punctuation. That's like the front keyboard of the Q-U-E-R-T-Y um, of the British English keyboard. And the punctuation is one step behind, if you like. Well, take a look at this one, where adding the dots seems to add something. It, it adds, I don't know, um, a, a note of regret or perhaps a, a note of expectation. It feels like there's a backstory there. Uh, I enjoyed Kevin's talk uh, just two days ago where he, he talked about those examples of very, very short uh, summaries for novels, like Hemingway's famous one about the baby's shoes. And um, I thought it might be interesting to, to play with the idea of how a story changes just in the most minimal kind of frame by the addition of punctuation. Could be a nice activity. And there, of course, is the back keyboard. I don't know what it's officially called, but I'm calling it the back keyboard. Um, and that's what allows us to, to punctuate and to bring some of our thoughts in chat mode to life. So um, a couple of people saying it looks romantic or like a lingering afterthought. Exactly. There's just a bit more of a story there, isn't there? Of course, we can use punctuation in, in a romantic way, in a, even a suggestive way, um, but we can also use it in quite a final way. Think about how the meaning changes when we get a message like this, um, where it suddenly sounds rather abrupt. Yes, miss you. could mean I miss you, but it could mean I'm mad at you as well. Um, And of course, these days we use so many uh, other forms of punctuation in the shape of emoticons. Um, I'll touch briefly on emoticons later, but I'm going to confine our thoughts today to the kind of punctuation that we see right here. I'm pointing uh, at something you can't see, which is my screen with this back keyboard. Uh, but, you know, the, the fairly familiar full stop, comma, slash, and colon, semicolon, and so on. Um, but I think it's it's a nice way to get into this theme, to think about the way we use punctuation um, on keyboards, because it kind of blurs the distinction between verbal conversation and what we used to think of as, of as a separate um, skill of writing and a, a separate mode of communication. And they're now so so closely aligned, really, in a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. The background, or my background, um, is in trying to encourage teachers to use conversation uh, in a very definite way in the classroom, in an extensive way in the classroom, and in a progressive way in the classroom. Uh, Teaching Unplugged, which I wrote with Scott Thornbury, has three principles. You may be familiar with these, you may not be. Um, the first principle is that lessons should be conversation driven. So they should be uh, as far as possible driven by conversation between the people in the room. Um, lessons should also be materials light. So we shouldn't overload our lessons with either course book material or supplementary material from resource books. Um, and by focusing on conversation, by either moving away from the course book or introducing very minimal stimulus into the classroom, we give students a chance to talk more and we give ourselves as teachers the chance to listen more to what they're saying. And so as well as being materials light and conversation driven, we think of these lessons as being focused on emergent language. Um, and the three things are interrelated and you can't really take one out of the equation without affecting the others. But as, as I've said and as I've emphasized, I think it's, it's very interesting to think about conversation now, not just as face-to-face -face conversation, we were talking about this just as the room opened earlier, but as the kind of extensive conversation that we have using our mobile devices and so on. We spend a lot of time, many of us, on those devices these days. So many kinds of writing can also be seen as conversation.
Ah, this is where my slides with a clever background might be a little hard to read. So I'll read through them for you. What do we mean by focusing on conversation? What are we hoping to achieve in the classroom? Well, we mean using conversation to reveal all the immediate possibilities of language use, all the things that can come up in the moment, all the things that can strike us as teachable moments or which might strike students as moments where they need help and some sort of intervention from the teacher. If we don't rely too much on materials, these possibilities can be easier to spot and easier to develop. And if we then work with a language that has come out of the interaction, the emergent language, we'll be doing something very important in terms of relevance and motivation in the classroom, and that is teaching the learner at the point of need. So uh, instead of doing everything uh, to a plan, instead of being clear before we even start a lesson of what we expect to happen at every juncture of that lesson, we are allowing enough space within that context to be responsive to what the students want to talk about and where that conversation takes the, them and yourself um, as, as the teacher in terms of language need. And if we're teaching the learner at the point of need, rather than thinking either that is in the book or that isn't in the book or that's not what I was expecting to, to talk about today, then we're talking to our students when the communicative moment is still alive. And that's what I want us to focus on here. That's where my thoughts on punctuation are um, directed, is that the idea of teaching at the point of need when the communicative moment is still alive. And I'd suggest that the only way to teach effectively in this way is to work with what the students give us. So again, it means either allowing more space in our planning for a more spontaneous kind of interaction in the classroom, or it means stepping aside from our plan when other opportunities arise, and then working with what we have, working with what the students give us, and of course, what the students give us will vary depending on their level, depending on the context and the reasons they're learning English and all kinds of things. But in a sense, what the students give us represents their level. It's what they are capable of saying. It's what they want to say. And if we work with that, then we're going to be doing the right thing by our students. And it means stepping back from the traditional role of the teacher as providing information. And it means exploring a different role where we are responding to information, the idea of responsive teaching. And something interesting starts to happen because instead of being at the very center of everything that happens in the classroom, we start to think of ourselves and perhaps even physically position ourselves as being at the side, not at the center. Um, and this positioning, which as I say, can be a, a mental positioning, but also a physical positioning, doesn't have to be in operation for the whole of a lesson. It might form part of a lesson where our role as a teacher changes and where we step back and where we allow what the students can say enough space to emerge and in a sense then give us enough to work with as teachers. It's very easy to jump in too quickly when we're teaching uh, because we see it as being very much at the heart of our job um, to help. It's not a bad impetus. It's not a bad instinct, a teaching instinct, but you know, if it's not used carefully, it, even with the best of intentions, it can mean that we're kind of intervening the whole time and not allowing our students the chance to, to kind of make the most of what they want to say and do. And if you think of teaching as, as 
at its heart, not a technical process, but a, a human process of helping someone. Then I think this becomes a little easier to, to work with, uh, this idea of being at the side, not at the center, and of stepping back. Um, imagine, for example, just being with young children, uh, your own children, or family, or friends, children. Um, or think back to when you were a child, and just think back to the kind of interactions that you have or had with children or with adults. Um, you have to allow a child to try things out. Um, if they're trying to ride a bike, you have to let them fall off. Uh, otherwise, they're never going to get further than your sense of their limitations. Um, and that, that sort of moment of decision, what do I do? Do I let the child run down the hill and probably possibly fall off or maybe finally be independent on the bicycle? Or, uh, or do I keep sort of holding their hand? Um, I'm just reading some of the, the comments here. Um, so Patricia's saying, I think this ability to provide or enable breathing space improves as we become more experienced and more comfortable in our teaching contexts. I think that's true. Um, and that's one reason why I think that it's important that teacher training takes account of these ideas. Because if we see being able to step back from a plan, and if we see responding to the students' needs, and as Ratna puts it, handling emergent language as a key part of our skill set as teachers from the start of our teaching careers, then I think we're more likely to develop these skills earlier um, rather than coming to them later. Um, I think it's also worth bearing in mind, I'm just looking at your comment there, Ratna, that we often have to deal with the unexpected even when we're extremely prepared for a lesson, uh, even when we're working very closely with the course book, uh, because people will always surprise us with their reactions and there will always be language questions that we suddenly find ourselves unprepared for. Um, and the kind of responses that we might give in that context of working with a course book and having an unexpected question are exactly the kind of responses that we might use in a dogma context. Um, uh, one of those responses would simply be to help uh, and to say, well, that's what this word means, or I think this is the word you're looking for, or you could put it differently like this. Or you could say, well, we're getting a little problem with this grammar structure. Let's look at it now together. But if you're not comfortable doing that at that moment, you can also say, I'm going to come back to you on that. And you can make a note of it yourself. And so teaching at the point of need doesn't just mean responding as far as possible in the moment. It also means kind of recording stuff. Um, taking notes yourself as a teacher, uh, certainly encouraging your students also to make notes, and then coming back to it, it might become your preparation for the next lesson to try and work out the best way of helping the students either develop a, a vocabulary set or understand the grammar point. So let's now think in a sense of exactly that challenge of, of managing conversation and handling language that we weren't expecting to come up. I think it's worth bearing in mind how worthwhile it is to us as teachers to find ourselves in unexpected situations. Um, and I think the culture around education as a whole is so geared towards, is so directed towards pre-planning, um, stated aims, learner outcomes, proof points, and whatever testing mechanism is used to assess all of that, that we can forget that being able to respond in the moment and also being able to cope with a scenario where we're not quite sure how to respond is a very necessary part of our skill set as teachers. And so I think it's something to embrace and like any skill, including perhaps more orthodox skills or what are now more orthodox skills, such as lesson planning and working with a course book, it 
gets easier with time. We get better at it as we practice. Um, yeah, I'm just seeing Mark's thought there. Teachers don't give breathing space because teachers don't get breathing space. I think that's absolutely true. And I think we, we work globally in an education culture where this emphasis on planning and stated aims and outcomes and testing um, is narrowing and squeezing the space in our classrooms. Uh, and so in that sense, I think we can think of extensive conversation within the classroom as, as, a, as an alternative to that, as a response to that over-controlled uh, view of education. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we just stop using a course book or stop teaching to the exam or stop teaching for an exam. Um, I'm suggesting we find as much space as we can and work in that space and make the most of it and learn how to develop it. And then I think also gradually see how working in that space, working with emergent language, becoming more confident as teachers, encouraging our students to be more confident in unexpected situations can pay off, not just in terms of uncovering the syllabus, as Scott would call it, not just in terms of a more confident um, response in an exam situation, but also in real life situations, because that scenario of holding the hand of the learner um, is possible within the classroom. Uh, whether or not it's desirable, it's possible. But it's not possible when our learners leave the room and they're then encountering English in, in real life situations, whether it's online or in the street, um, uh, whether it's in you know, a leisure context or, or in a work context. And so this ability to work in the moment um, is, is also relevant to the student's ability to use language in the moment and to feel confident enough to navigate unexpected situations. If everything we do in class is so carefully managed that there are no surprises for anyone, for us or the students, then we're not helping our own personal development as teachers. And we're not actually helping our students to prepare for real life language situations, which are unpredictable. Let's, let's just come back. I'll, I'll try and uh, relate um, to you all and, and respond to some of your comments uh, as we go along. I don't want to come back to this idea of punctuation and the idea that our interventions in the classroom are a kind of punctuation. First off, what are we punctuating? Um, I'm pleased that this little graphic has come off. Um, I'm thinking of how conversation starts, because if you're not used to using conversation in the classroom, you might easily worry about how it starts. But, you know, it, it, very often conversation is something that's already started. I mean, how do we start a conversation in the staff room? It's often the case that we're joining a conversation and not starting one. That's where this mental positioning of being at the side of the classroom and not at the center and listening to and responding to what the students are already thinking or talking about can pay off. If we start a conversation in the staff room um, or in the bar or the cafe, uh, it, it's, we don't take it from a kind of random series of potential conversation themes. We, we take it from what's around us, stuff that we've seen on Facebook or something that's just happened, the fact that there's a shower of rain outside, which is what this illustration relates to. Um, maybe there was a, a great game of football last night in town, or maybe there are people on the streets protesting against something. There's, there's always something to talk about. And so I think, again, if we can just sit back a little and perhaps on our way to class, think what might be interesting conversation topics, perhaps as we start the class, listen to what the students are talking about and think, well, how can we develop these as a conversation? And that nervousness goes away. This is an example of how punctuation is looked at in the public space um, about getting things right or wrong. Um, quite often people post pictures on Facebook of 
bits of punctuation that people have got wrong. And this is a favorite example where an apostrophe gets put in the wrong place. Um, the thing is, if you see a sign saying tomatoes outside a, a grocer's shop uh, with an apostrophe in, apostrophe in, you're not confused. You know that they're selling tomatoes. And I'm more interested, as I've already suggested, by looking at the, the chat text with the use of punctuation as an expressive tool. And how can we use it in that way in the classroom? I'm interested in what punctuation provides, because it provides clarity. And I'm thinking of texts now. So yes, it tells us when a sentence ends and when another one begins. And it gives us clues about how to read a text. But it also allows us to be expressive. It signals pace, and it signals structure, and it signals emphasis. And it signals emotion, spelt wrong. How did that happen? Hmm. <laughs> That's a strange spelling of emotion. Well, perhaps I was feeling emotional when I wrote it. Um, so in the same way that punctuation in text is often associated with accuracy. So let me just scroll back. Here's that, whoops, here's that mistake where the punctuation is in the wrong place. And we notice it. We think, ah. Oh, in the same way, teacher interventions are often seen in terms of error correction. Think of how we correct student text. We often have our own kind of code, which is our own punctuation, where we perhaps use different colors or we use abbreviations for spelling, SP or grammar, G, or we, we have a system of arrows. We have our own sort of correction code, which acts as punctuation. But we also use a whole range of ways of punctuating interaction with students face to face. Um, and sometimes, again, it can be really hard not to be all teachery about it when somebody's trying to say something. And uh, so instead of reacting to what they're saying as a theme or as an expression of their feelings or, or thoughts, we react to the grammar or the vocabulary choice. And often we find ourselves, I think, as, as teachers, punctuating what our learners are saying with a, a series of, <laughs> kind of facial expressions. And so we're listening to what they're saying. And as long as it's accurate, we nod and as we smile, an encouragement and then we frown when somebody gets something wrong and then perhaps we prompt them to try something again. Um, and I think if we think of it from a student point of view, this must get pretty dispiriting. Um, that's not really the live feedback I'm thinking of actually. Um, because it's so focused on performance and we're reacting to student performance, what Shreya has called there the all too familiar frown. So everything's going well and we're smiling and then and then suddenly the focus moves from yes, eye expressions can be powerful, says Peggy. So true. The focus moves from what's being said and from the flow of language uh, which the, the student at whatever level is producing. Um, the focus suddenly is on performance and on, and on accuracy. And Patricia, a very nice thought there. I try to make mental notes and just keep on smiling. Yeah, I think that's great. And very much in that spirit, I want to think about teacher interventions from a perspective not of correction, but of encouragement and explanation. And in a way, like Patricia, who's making mental notes but smiling, I'd like to think in terms of our being more selective in our interventions, a bit more aware of the punctuation that we're using, whether it's facial or verbal. And Julie says, hand on cheek can be very discouraging. Yeah, it feels like I'm about to intervene. 
and kind of go, okay, hold on, okay, cut. <laughs> uh, but you know, conversation isn't performance; it's it's interaction. And if we, the more we can make conversation, a place conversation at the heart of our classes, the less it will feel like performance to students, and the more it will feel like a, a genuine human experience. And I sometimes see unplugged teaching as a combination of play and pause. Think of the controls that you have on, um, well, in the old days, a cassette recorder, or uh, these days on an iPod, or on your phone, or on any number of um, platforms for, for content. I don't know if you can pause me now. You might want to. I think I can pause myself here. I won't do it because I might not come back. Um, but, you know, this idea of play and pause is essential to so many uh, platforms we use. And I think it's a helpful um, thing to bear in mind for unplugged teaching. Because there are moments where, as Aida says here, students need to express themselves with no fear. And teachers must encourage them while listening instead of correcting every mistake. Um, but equally, uh, there are moments where we feel it's now time to, to say something. Um, it's now time to kind of maybe make a point about the language that's being used to bring some of your mental notes into the discussion. And that might well mean actually moving from the side where you've been listening and not intervening very much and standing up, moving to the board, starting to make some notes and adopting a more traditional teacher role. Okay, so Julie's talking about chins and cheeks here. I'm, I'm going to let Julie talk about that. Cheek can make it look like you're finding it hard to listen. Okay. Um, so I've divided my punctuation marks into punctuation marks that relate to our interventions, interventions in play mode when we're allowing conversation to play out, when we're sitting at the side, uh, and when we're ideally, um, as Aida says, allowing students to express themselves without fear. And then also this pause mode where we intervene more directly and start to handle, uh, as someone put it earlier, some of the emergent language. Before we do that, I'd just like you to punctuate this talk. Um, do you remember I asked you to note down your favorite punctuation mark? Um, I'd like you to enter it into the chat box now. This is a little half time in the talk. Okay, some exclamation marks, colon, semicolon. <laughs> this is going to be a strange bit of the transcript. It's going to look like everything broke down. Okay, a lot of punctuation marks. I guess you could do things like this in class. You could do some sort of poll. Um, lots of exclamation marks, some dots, a smiley there, a heart, some emoticons coming in. Um, I think there are little activities that you could do with punctuation marks. Um, I think just a, a survey on favorite punctuation marks and then a discussion just to kind of bring those slightly formal markers to life is a nice starting point. Um, but you could also use a sort of projective technique, like if you were a punctuation mark, which one would you want to be? Or which punctuation mark do you feel like? Um, which is most or least like your own character? And that's a lovely note from Peggy. Um, people have started to tattoo semicolons onto their skin um, uh, as a symbol for advocating mental health. And I've saved an article on this, actually. Um, I'm glad you remind me of it, Peggy. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Peggy, but I think the idea there is to stress that life can go on and, and that, um, well, essentially, there is a way out of depression. Is that right, Peggy? It's a, it's a beautiful way of acknowledging difficulty in life 
but of also expressing the determination to carry on or the support for people who, who find themselves in difficulties. And, and uh, it looks as if Chuck sent a link to that. So, yeah, that's lovely. Um, well, there you are. There's something that I didn't expect to come out of this conversation. Lovely. Thanks for that, Peggy. Yeah, so as I say, you, you, you could have fun doing a kind of poll in the classroom and you can think about which what punctuation marks mean to you because all of these punctuation marks are, are expressive in their own way. Another great activity is to talk using abbreviations. This is Effie. All right, let's play. Well, I guess the first punctuation mark that I'd like to talk about is the quotation mark, because speech is at the heart of teaching unplugged. Um, we can write punctuation marks as singles or doubles. Um, but it's key because we're working with what people want to say and what they want to talk about, and that's the raw material. And part of it is just listening. So we're listening to what people have to say with, at the side and not at the center. But there's another interesting side to this because we can actually start to quote what people said back to the class. Um, I suppose you could call it a kind of recycling. Um, so when you pause the lesson, you quote what somebody said. And you said, you remember when Maria said this? Can you remember her exact words? Maria, can you remember what you said? Sometimes students will correct themselves naturally if you prompt them in that way. They reformulate naturally. Um, we could also make mental notes. I like to make physical notes. I mean, my students are used to seeing me making physical notes as well as mental notes. Uh, and it's a very important way of recording and then learning how to handle. My headphones sprang out. Um, emergent language. You can return to a theme the next day. You can say, remember yesterday we were talking about this and Abdul Rahim said this about his weekend. Um, and this quoting back uh, serves two purposes. It allows us to really make the learner's language the center of the classroom. And it also helps to build community. So we're suddenly making ourselves part of the lesson and part of the course and part of the continuity between one lesson and another. So punctuation marks can mean just listening, just sitting back and listening. Um, but they can also serve this purpose of replaying language from the learners back to the learners. The next punctuation mark in play mode is simply not doing anything. <laughs> And we've touched on this earlier. Um, and it can be a really tricky thing to do. And, and if we don't do anything, I mean, if we're not responsive in any way, then that's not going to be encouraging to our learners. But silence can be very powerful um, in the classroom. And if we intervene too quickly when a learner pauses, um, when a learner can't quite find the words they want, then again, we're we're rushing to hold the hand of the child. We're rushing to steady the bicycle. And we're not allowing the learner to experience that sense of balance for themselves and to use all of their own resources. I think it's just something to bear in mind. I know that Scott quotes in Teaching Unplugged, in the introduction to Teaching Unplugged, something that the actor, the great Hollywood actor Gregory Peck, used to write in his scripts. One of Gregory Peck's famous roles was as Atticus in To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, the sequel, or the prequel to To Kill a Mockingbird has just come out to, to general um, surprise and disappointment in lots of ways, actually. Um, but Gregory Peck, when he was given a script and when he started to work with a script, uh, would apparently write at moments, at intervals in the margins, N-A-R, meaning no acting required. Um, and Scott drew an analogy with teaching. No teaching required. <laughs> Ask yourself, watch yourself. Maybe make notes. Thinking back to Divya's talk yesterday, and this would be a very 
informal way of researching your own practice. But, you know, reflect on what you're doing. Think about what you're doing when you encourage, when you sit back, and when you allow some silence to either prompt a student to say more, or alternatively, you may find that you've used silence in the wrong way, and we can only learn from that by playing with it. We have to ride the bike downhill as teachers too. So we're still in play mode, play mode rather. Um, and here we might intervene more directly. And we've talked a lot about facial reactions. And we can, of course, ask students to say more simply by nodding and encouraging and by sitting back. But sometimes we might simply ask them to say a bit more, to explain themselves. Um, can you tell us more about that is a really nice um, non-directive question which might encourage students to say more. Can you tell us some more? That's really interesting. What happened next? Has anybody else in the class had an experience like this? Now, none of that in itself is, is the kind of rocket science. It's the sort of thing that we do naturally um, in the classroom situation. But I think the, the challenge with teaching Unplugged is to do it more uh, and to work with all the opportunities that it can provide, but also to work with some of the challenges that it represents. And I'm thinking, I guess, there of the question in play mode as being much more related to content, um, to what people are talking about, uh, rather than to form, to how they're saying it in the words and the language they're using. So remember, play mode and pause mode. Play mode is very much focused on encouraging the conversation between the students. And you are an active participant in that as a teacher. Sitting at the side doesn't mean adopting a role of complete silence. Uh, it just means being part of the group instead of leading the group. And so asking a question directly is a, is a very valid way of intervening. And of course, uh, encouraging conversation can just be verbal response. Um, one of the things that can happen in, in a classroom situation, especially where there's a strong focus on form, um, even in kind of controlled practice mode, uh, is that there isn't very much ambient noise uh, between the speakers. People, if they're focused on getting things right, will pause and speak and pause to see if they've got something right. And other people may also be focused on the accuracy rather than the content. So encouraging learners to react, um, either by asking questions or simply by responding, by saying things like, wow, really? Wow. You know, to, I sort of drill students to say things like this. And you can have fun drilling a very engaged and excited wow with a rather unengaged wow. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of fun to be had with expression. Um, but this is also part of this punctuation in class. Um, and, and it's not just us as the teacher. It's trying to build a culture in which everybody is reacting verbally. So you're not the only one asking questions. Um, so you're not the only one responding. And if you encourage this culture to develop, it will develop because this is how we speak naturally as human beings. It, it's part of our wiring. But it takes time, it takes patience. It, it doesn't happen in one lesson. Uh, it, it requires experiment on your part and you're also encouraging your students to experiment. You can be explicit about it. You could come back the next day and say, remember yesterday when we just talked? Remember yesterday when it started pouring with rain and we just talked? Uh, remember yesterday when somebody said this and we just talked? Well, for a start, you won't have just talked because you will have paused the conversation in the ways I'm about to suggest and looked at language then and there. But you'll find that you can come back to it in, in the next lesson. But you might speak to the students. Well, how did you feel about this? How do you feel about talking a little bit more at, at length, talking more extensively? So involve them in trying to build a different culture, trying to increase the, the space that's available to you and your students. So I, I hope this kind of play-pause idea is, is clear. I, th I think it's a very reassuring way to think about 
teaching Unplugged um, because it combines perhaps something that's maybe less familiar to you as a teacher in sitting back and allowing conversation to develop, something that might be less familiar to the students also finding themselves corrected less often for part of the lesson. It combines that with something that's much more familiar, which is where you actively get involved and start to explain about language and start to help directly with language and to give the students reference points. And that's the pause part of the lesson. So just to recap, conscious of time, I think we're doing okay. Quotation marks is just about placing conversation at the center of what we do for the available time and remembering that we can use that conversation and quote it back to the class and think how powerful it is to quote language and things that our students have said and spoken about rather than always referring to the course book. And we talked about the, the art of letting go in a way, uh, no teaching required, just allowing things to develop in class. We talked about more direct intervention, asking a question, the kind of questions that encourage a conversation to continue, open questions, not closed questions, building a culture where, where students get used to that as well. And then, of course, this very important point um, of, of reacting in a human way to what's being said and giving our students license and, and the encouragement to, to respond audibly so that there isn't that sort of non-ambient quiet in a classroom, there's more noise, there's more ambience, there's more response. So if that's the play part of the lesson, what happens when you pause language? Now this could happen after a minute of conversation, it could happen after 15 minutes of conversation. And it's only by experimenting with this, if you're unfamiliar with it, um, that you'll become more confident. One way to pause is just by Explaining, to me, the colon is a very direct explanatory punctuation in a text. I've said this, it means this. Yeah? So let's say that your students are trying to say something and they can't find a word, then a quick pause may, might be, this is the word you're looking for, or this is the structure that you're trying to use. Or it might be an explanation about a language point. Yeah? So using a colon in the pause section means just teaching in a very conventional sense, offering explanation, offering advice. Then we have the semicolon, which might be a slightly longer explanation. If the colon is very direct, this is the word you're after, say it like this. It's because it works like this then the semicolon might be a, a longer explanation. It might be, why don't you think about it this way? Let's look at these five examples of, let's say, use of the past simple in the past, in this lesson. Let's look at what you actually said and let's try and perhaps reformulate them. Let's think about why this form worked here, why it didn't work here, why it was well formed here, why it was less well formed here. This is the kind of pause that might actually happen overnight where you think about it yourself. You think, why, why do they find that so hard? And um, it might mean coming back to the classroom the next day with a grammar activity. It might mean coming back with something very conventional. It might mean returning to something in the course book that you've already done. It might mean jumping forward in the course book uh, to something that's yet to come and saying, you know what, this is going to help us with that thing that came up in yesterday's class. <coughs> So if the colon is giving some language, then the semicolon is giving more examples, explaining, inviting students to maybe think about it this way, this time. Here's the slash, and I've used this to illustrate the idea of alternatives, alternative ways of saying things. Um, and maybe at a very low level, you would be just trying to find that one word or just trying to get that one form right. But um, as we all know, English has a large active vocabulary and it has a relatively small operative formal grammar system. Uh, and so what can happen is that people get the basics of English quite quickly 
and reach this kind of low intermediate level and then find it hard to push on from there. And one of the aspects of learning language which helps you get beyond the pre-intermediate stage is finding more ways to say the same thing, you know, finding the synonym for something. Absolutely essential when you're dealing with a large vocabulary. And uh, it can be very straightforward. We can think of the closest possible synonym to something. Um, or it can be more subtle, and that will depend a bit on level and what your students are capable of. So it might be a case of working with the subtleties of synonyms. Why is happy not quite the same as joyful? When might we use delighted? To me, delighted is a little formal uh, compared with happy. I might use it in writing. Um, th those are questions that, again, we're familiar with as teachers. You might be able to come up with an activity like this on the spot because you could say, look, we use this word. Can you think of another word for it? Can you think of an opposite word? Another way to say that, but to mean the opposite. And so alternative ways of saying the same thing um, is absolutely key in helping students develop their level in the broadest sense. Sometimes we can supply suggestions on the spot. Sometimes we might, again, as I've said, need to think about it overnight. All right. So far then, in the pause section, we've looked at the colon, direct supply, if you like, of an explanation. The semicolon, so a longer explanation using examples. We've looked at this as a way of expressing the idea of giving alternatives to language and building vocabulary, maybe up um, in the moment or overnight on the spot. And here's the hashtag. Um, once I would suggest one of the least used characters on our keyboards, now one of the most used and maybe hashtag overused characters on our keyboards. Um, but we tend to use hashtags uh, to relate what we're saying. I'm thinking of our experience in social networks and in chat with each other. We tend to use hashtags to refer to something else. So we, we use it to refer to hashtag summer intensive, which is a thing. We use it to refer to hashtag um, inspiring uh, if we're sort of referring to the notion of an inspiring educational experience. Um, as I know the summer intensive has been in its entirety and will continue to be. Um, but one of the ways, which again employs things which are orthodox tools for teachers and learners, one of the ways to handle emergent language is to give reference points. Use a dictionary. Use a learner dictionary. Refer a problem that's coming up, a language form that's coming up with something that's been in the course book or which is coming into the course book. Maybe refer a natural, spontaneous conversation to the theme of a course book unit. If somebody's talking about food they've eaten, that could lead into all kinds of areas. It could easily lead into a unit about health, or it could lead into a unit about, I don't know, the environment, if we're thinking about the ways that food is produced. So don't just think of the unplugged part of your classes as being a, a separate experience. Think of ways to relate it to the parts of your class where you, I was going to say, where you have less control. <laughs> you have less control over deciding what happens, but I guess in a way you have more control over the resulting classroom interaction. That's one for another day. Um, but the point is that the unplugged parts of a class, the spontaneous right. interaction, it isn't a completely separate experience. Right? You can find ways to relate it to dictionaries, to course books, to themes that they've already been discussing. Only due to exam material. Okay. We are really done. Language changes. There's the at sign. Again, that was used very little in the old days. It meant at the cost of when I was growing up. Get it in maths some school. Um, but now it's a pretty groovy bit of punctuation. I guess to hang out with hashtag, it's a verb. People talk about atting each other. It's become a lifestyle choice. So it's a good example of how language changes, as of course is the emoticon. Um, this is how emoticon started. If you type that on a Mac and somebody gets it on a a word EC that'll come out as a J, so things can look pretty strange. Um, and 
you know, very often interaction on chat platforms is based around emoticons, little pictures um, of all kinds of facial expressions and the famous dancer in a red dress. And I don't know whether that's an emoticon or just a very tiny picture, really. You don't think of punctuation and conversation as being visible. We think of it as being invisible, even though cartoonists animate their drawings with visible punctuation signs. Here's a, a, a photo of a page from one of my Tintin books. Uh, and if you look at cartoon books, then they're full of, full of visible punctuation, punctuation to bring those things to life. So what's happening in class when we punctuate our interaction with students in, in the ways that we've been talking about? Think about the back keyboard again. Think about being at the side of the class. We're typing what we want to say in words and we want to give it expression. So we, we press on another key and we get our back keyboard with all the punctuation. I think teaching unplugged involves a back keyboard. Um, it's the stuff we know matters as teachers, but which doesn't always have to be up front. It's about letting mistakes go by and making a mental note and smiling, as one of you so beautifully put it earlier. So use that back keyboard lightly. Wait for the right moment to intervene. Sometimes it's about what comes between the words that counts. Sometimes it's about what lies in the margins. If all we ever do is use course books and publish materials and teach to the test, then we're all going to end up in the margins. The students and ourselves as teachers and our teacher, de teacher development, our personal development, which this whole summer intensive is all about, is going to remain in the margins because we're not going to be using the available space to explore everything that can be done in a classroom. So punctuation in terms of teacher intervention is about helping students bridge the gaps between words, to bridge the gap between ideas, helping them to organize their thought. Maybe if we learn to step back and to listen and to keep our eye on the periphery, that'll be a very good positioning for us as teachers. We'll be sitting back, wondering where we can take the conversation helping learners make sense of words that can't quite fit, they can't quite fit to the context, or finding words that they're looking for, but which are just out of reach. Um, and although we'll be at the side of the class at these points, we're actually going to be fully alive in the moment, truly engaged with what we're doing, and helping our learners at the point of need. Not just because there's an exam coming up, um, not just because one day that's going to help them to get a job, but because they're individuals with a voice that needs to be heard. And our voice needs to be heard too. Uh, it's getting harder to hear the voice of teachers. And Divya spoke beautifully about our potential with a voice in the classroom yesterday. Um, across the world, we're increasingly seen by education departments not so much as teachers, but as test administrators. Everything we've talked about today really matters, not just to our students and to our personal development, but to the wider context of where education is going. Maybe our voices and the voices of the students, when we think of it that way, aren't so different. Maybe if we can learn to work together in the classroom, on the ground, in the moment, they don't have to be different. The more I thought about punctuation, the more interesting it became. Um, not just in terms of how we respond to student interaction, but in terms of the role we play in the classroom. Because if you think about it, it's punctuation that holds a text together. Teaching in the public discourse is often also, like punctuation, seen as being about getting things right or wrong. Um, the newspapers, Divya again quoted a 
a report yesterday about money wasted on teacher training. And newspapers can be very, very negative um, about what teachers do in classrooms. So it's important that events like the summer intensive help us to locate what's positive about what we do. So just to conclude, we aren't the words in the student's story. We're not creating their stories, at least I don't think we should. But we can give structure to what they want to say, helping them with their expression, giving them the confidence to speak about their hopes, their fears, their days and their dreams. So maybe if you look at it that way, we are the punctuation marks in their learning journey. And the story would fall apart without us. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. I'm a minute over. Uh, I hope it's been useful. And thanks for the positive feedback that I can see there. Thank you, Luke. I was busy back typing all these great things you're saying so that I could get them down. Thank you so much. I know I have the recording, but I'm a note taker too. It's a wonderful session. I think we'll have the chat as well. We have, we do have the chat, and we do have the recording that will be available very, very soon. And I've got a little bit of echo coming in. Just let me. Fantastic stuff. I love, I love the book you wrote with Scott. It's really great to, to see you talking about these things and, and, and bringing them, expanding them, especially with the help of all the teachers here today. Really nice. Well, that's, that's the point, isn't it? So yes. <laughs> expand each other's thinking and ideas. I think Luke would maybe, Luke's got a busy day with another webinar coming right up with uh, so Belta in an hour or so, but I would bet he would be willing to hang around for That's just right. a, half, half an hour. hour. He's, he's got to fly. <laughs> yeah. fly. He's got to fly out of here. <laughs> Over to Toe Belta. But I do before you, you go, Luke. I, I do want to mention that you you have a you have an ITDI advanced class coming up very soon. In October. I do. And I'm very excited. About you do. It. I do. It's called, do. It's called Learning Space. We do. Yes, we all do. And I hope a lot of people will be there for it. I'm going to take us over to the lobby here. Hang on. There we go. So that's coming up in October. It's called, it's called Learning Space. Luke is also uh, developing a column for galleryteachers.com, also called Learning Space. It's all about the learning space. So that's, that's coming up. And I, <laughs> it's, all, it's all about the learning space. And I, I've seen the first column already, and it's just very, very interesting about the next Where will that column be featured? A different Chuck? kind of punctuation. Uh, Galleryteachers.com. And the ITDI course yes. is going to be on ITDI, of course, in, in October. Yeah.